VXLAN is a critical part of data center networking technology, and it is also the foundation for software-defined networking. Hi, I'm Rich. Welcome to the Rich Tech Guy channel, and in this video, I'm going to start a multi-part series on VXLAN, what it is, and why it is such a great technology for data center networking. So before I get started on that though, if you like this content, please go ahead and hit that like button. And if you wanna see the rest of the videos in this series as they come out, go ahead and hit that subscribe button uh, as well. So that way you won't miss anything on VXLAN. So what is VXLAN? Well, VXLAN is defined by the IETF standard RFC 7348. And the simplest way I can put it is that it is an extension of the layer two VLAN technology that has been the core of switched networks ever since IEEE came up with the 802.1Q standards back in 1998. Now, what does that do? Well, it creates greater flexibility, scalability, and redundancy while solving some of the limitations of the traditional layer two networking. So when we go into flexibility with VXLAN, let's say you're running a managed services provider or a cloud provider and you're supporting multiple customers in your data center. With VXLAN, you can separate those customers out into different tenants and utilize the same infrastructure to connect everything and maintain that solid logical separation so that customer A's traffic doesn't end up on customer B's network. Now, in terms of scalability, VXLAN also provides you with a 24-bit VNID or virtual VXLAN network identifier. This allows you up to 16 million different VXLAN segments as opposed to the traditional VLAN uh, ID, which was a 12-bit ID identifier and that only got you 4096 different VLANs. And in return in terms of redundancy and expanding your uh, your network beyond the, the layer two limitations, what VXLAN allows you to do is you can create a layer three network within your data center and move the layer two across that. So if you go and take a look at some of my uh, videos on spanning tree, you can see that with a traditional layer two network, spanning tree goes and shuts down certain links to prevent loops. Well, in the uh, data center, this is really bad. We want as much bandwidth and as much redundancy as possible. And the other thing about that, about spanning tree is that when it, shuts down links, if there's a failure, it can take up to a minute to resolve that and open up new links. And this is just, uh, it's just gonna kill a critical service going on in the data center. So by utilizing layer three, we can take advantage of routing protocols and equal cost multipathing to maintain redundancy across the links within the network of the data center and then we only utilize layer two at the final step or the final hop to the end devices. But we can maintain that logical separation across the layer three network. So how does VXLAN work? Well, the simple explanation is that when traffic in a VXLAN network needs to cross a layer three boundary, the switches at each end of the layer three network create VPN tunnels across that network. And the switches at each end create what are called VTEPs, which stands for VXLAN tunnel endpoint. And when they put the traffic through that uh, tunnel, they take the MAC frame from the layer two network and encapsulate it in a UDP IP packet. This is also referred to as MAC in UDP encapsulation. So let's take a look at a VXLAN frame. All right, so let's take a look at the VXLAN frame itself. So what I've got here is a picture of a encapsulated VXLAN frame. And to start with, you've got the outer ethernet header. This is identifying the 
source and destination MAC addresses, you're doing a layer two hop within your uh, layer three network. So a device to, to device hop. Then you've got the outer IP header, which is going to be identifying the source and destination VTEP devices and will help with routing this frame across your layer three network. Next up, the following eight bytes is going to be the outer UDP header. And this is where you're going to be tagging the VXLAN traffic uh, in this frame as you've got the VXLAN destination UDP port identified within it. And lastly, we've got the VXLAN header, which is going to contain any necessary VXLAN flags as well as the VNID identifying the logical traffic separation for this particular frame. And then inside of all of that, we have the actual inner Ethernet frame from our layer two network traversing to the other layer two network and carrying the actual Ethernet payload. Now, as a result of having all of this extra data tagged on to the frame, it's really recommended that you change your MTU for VXLAN to go to 9216, the maximum size of jumbo frames, and that your devices handling the VXLAN traffic are capable of supporting that frame size. So here's the beauty of VXLAN. When the traffic is crossing the layer three network inside of the VXLAN tunnel, the VTEP switches tag it with the VNI or VNID, which is the VXLAN network identifier. Now the devices that uh, exist within the layer three network between VTEPs don't even have to be capable of supporting VXLAN. Now, as I did say, it is recommended that you utilize the maximum MTU for the frames you're sending across of 9216. So you do need that support on the devices in between, but they do not need actual VXLAN support. So when utilizing the VXLAN control plane, there are really two ways that VXLAN VTEP switches can learn where to send traffic across the network. The first of these is flood and learn. And the flood and learn mechanism utilizes traditional layer two technology and, and mechanisms where the VTEPs will flood traffic across the, uh, the network to the other VTEP switches and then build out its MAC tables and MAC to VTEP assignments based off of the replies that it receives. So what happens there is in order to limit some of the uh, the traffic, uh, it utilizes multicast IPs to to send to the other VTEP switches within that that are utilizing that same VNI as opposed to just a broadcast across your layer three network. Let's take a look at an example of how the flood and learn technique works. Okay, so here we have an example of the flood and learn process on a VXLAN network. Now, right now I've got a spine leaf topology and the uh, everything here is within the same VNI, the uh, 3010, just for simplicity's sake. But we've got server one wants to contact server two and it needs to know the MAC address. So it's gonna create an ARP request and it is going to send that on to leaf one. Leaf one is going to check its MAC address table and realize that it doesn't know where that is. So it is going to convert that into a VXLAN packet and it is going to send it out to the multicast IP address for that particular VNI. And when it sends that out, the, uh, via, the multicast route processor is going to then forward that on to all of the other switches that are involved with that multicast IP logged into it. And the, the, that means leaf two and leaf three get it. So what they're going to do is they're going to compare with their MAC address table and they're going to add server one's MAC into their table before they de-encapsulate the packet and send it out across their networks for the end devices. And once they do that, then what we're going to see here is that server three and storage, they don't really have any use for this. This ARP request wasn't for them, so they just get rid of it. Server two is then going to create an ARP reply and 
send that back to Leaf2. If Leaf2 doesn't have Server2's MAC address, it's going to update it at this point, encapsulate it, send it back across the VLAN, and over to Leaf1. Leaf1 receives it, is going to update its MAC address table with Server2's MAC, and then it is going to de-encapsulate and send the packet on to Server1. So now that Server1 knows where the, the uh, uh, MAC address for Server2 or what that MAC address is. So while this method works, it does send a lot of unnecessary traffic across the network. Now to mitigate this, another control method was developed for VXLAN, and that utilizes multi-protocol BGP, or MPBGP, with Ethernet VPN, or eVPN. Now, when we're thinking about BGP, we typically think about large networks that span massive amounts of, of area. And as an example would be a few years back where I was setting up some Nexus switches uh, with a customer to connect to a major telecommunications provider. And as soon as we got all the BGP uh, configuration worked out and everything synced up, the, the routing table just massively scaled up to hundreds of routes. So circling back to VXLAN. BGP provides some useful features that we can use. Uh, for instance, network layer reachability information. And BGP will have a data set of all the MAC and IP addresses necessary for VXLAN traffic. So when we're utilizing VXLAN with MPBGP and eVPN, what happens is the VTEP switches share their data with BGP and the only data that really gets flooded across the VXLAN network is the BUM traffic, so broadcast, unknown, unicast, and multicast. And then the traffic is further reduced by utilizing a route reflector to limit the number of BGP sessions on the network. So by utilizing this method, the VTEP switches, as they're sending traffic across the network, they set the destination MAC address to the remote VTEP. And then it becomes the responsibility of that remote VTEP to pass it on to the destination host. So how do we configure VXLAN on our network? Now I'm going to go over this in more detail in my next video, but from a high level, these are the steps you're going to go through. First, you're going to configure the layer 3 network links between your VXLAN switches in the environment. Next, you're going to configure a link state routing protocol to handle the traffic on that underlay network. So something like OSPF or intermediate system to intermediate system. Then you're going to configure BGP and you're gonna set up root reflectors on the non-VXLAN VTEP switches. So if you're looking at a spine leaf network topology, that would be your spine switches would be the BGP root reflectors. After that, you're going to set up the multicast routing and uh, one of the preferred methods would be PIM sparse mode. And then you're going to enable VXLAN on the switches. After you've got VXLAN up and running, you're going to map the VNIs to VLANs. And then you're going to create network virtualization edge interfaces for the VNIs on your VTEP switches. After that, you are going to configure BGP eVPN. And lastly, you're going to connect your devices to your VXLAN network, and you're going to make sure that they are in the correct VLANs or VNIDs. All right, so that is VXLAN packed into a nutshell with the density of a singularity. Now, in my next video, I'm going to go over the steps involved in deploying VXLAN. So if you like this content, please do me a favor, hit that like button and be sure to also hit that subscribe button so you can catch the rest of the VXLAN series and the videos that I will be putting out. And you'll never miss an episode here on the Rich Tech Guy channel. Now, at some point, I'm sure I'll come up with a nice catchphrase to sign off on. But for now, thank you for watching.